Here we go. <laughs> what is going on, everyone? How is your day, Knowledge and Noggins? I hope you're doing well. I hope life is full of love for you because today I will be telling some great NDEs or near death experiences, which the individual experiencing them does indeed experience a great enveloping love. So, saying that, I love you and I am thankful that you are tuning in to today's episode. So, without further ado, I'm your host, Chet Banks, and you are tuning in to Pick the Mind. Pick the Mind. First, let's begin with a man by the name of Arthur Jensen. Arthur Jensen was another near-death experiencer who received knowledge of reincarnation. In August of 1932, Jensen, a university graduate, geologist, and staunch materialist, turned syndicated cartoonist, decided to take some time off to research his weekly car, uh, cartoon strip, Adventurous Willie Wispo. Since his main character was a hobo, Jensen became a hobo for a time, blending in with the uh, over 16 million unemployed at that time in our nation's Great Depression. He bummed rides from Chicago through Minnesota until a young man in a convertible coupe picked him up uh, and on the way to Winnipeg, Going, they were going a little too fast for the road conditions. The car hit a three-foot-high ridge of oiled gravel and flipped into a series of violent somersaults. Both men were catapulted through the cloth before the car smashed into a ditch. The driver escaped unharmed, but Jensen was injured, losing his consciousness just as two female spectators rushed to his aid. After seeing the afterlife during this near-death experience, he later learned that telling others about it, this uh, his NDE often brought criticism, especially from the church. But there were those who would listen, and uh, as time wore on, more and more people would ask him about it. Finally, in 1955, Arthur Jensen published a report of his near-death experience after much public interest. His book entitled, I Saw Heaven. I believe this book is out of print, but you should be able to find a photocopy somewhere. In Arthur Jensen's words, he describes his near-death experience as follows. I felt as if I were coming loose from my body. While I believed that my body was me, I knew instinctively that, I, that if I separated from it, I'd be dead. My soul and body started separating again and continued to separate until I felt a short, sharp pain in my heart, which felt as if something had been torn loose. Then slowly and softly I rose out through the top of my head. Gradually the earth scene faded away, and up through it loomed a bright, new, beautiful world. Beautiful beyond imagination. For half a minute I could see both worlds at once. The earth fading away, and the other world looming up brighter and brighter, and still brighter. Finally, when the earth was all gone, I stood in a glory that could only be heaven. In the background were two beautiful mountains similar to Fujiyama of Japan. The tops were snow-capped, and the slopes were adorned with foliage of indescribable beauty. Since there was no pollution, haze, or other obstructions to mar one's vision, all the details were sharp and clear. The mountains appeared to be about 15 miles away, yet I could see individual flowers growing on their slopes. I estimated my vision to be about 100 times better than on earth. While I stood there marveling, I saw 20 people beyond the first trees, playing a sing singing dancing game something like Skip to Malu. They were having a hilarious time holding hands and dancing in a circle, fast and lively. Their singing, their laughter, and even their shouting was melodious. As soon as they saw me, Four of the players left the game and joyfully skipped over to greet me. As they approached, I estimated their ages to be one, thirty years old, two, about twenty years old, and one, tw uh, about twelve years old. Their bodies seemed almost weightless, and the grace and beauty of their easy movements was fascinating to watch. As the heaven people gathered around, the oldest, largest, and strongest looking man announced pleasantly, You are in the land of the dead. We lived on earth just like you till we came here. With unbounded enthusiasm, I shouted, This is wonderful! It's marvelous, they answered. 
Then with delight, they told me how I could swim around in the lake as long as I pleased, and when I came out, I'd be dry. Another one said, You can run, jump, dance, sing, and play as much as you want, and you'll never get tired. Then I noticed that the landscape was gradually becoming familiar. It seemed as if I had been here before. I remembered what was on one side of the mountains. Then with a sudden burst of joy, I realized that this was my real home. Back on earth, I had been a visitor, a misfit, and a homesick stranger. With a sigh of relief, I said to myself, Thank God I'm back again. This time, I'll stay. Then the oldest man, who looked like a Greek god, continued to explain, Everything over here is pure. The elements don't mix or break down as they do on earth. Everything is kept in place by an all-pervading master vibration which prevents aging. That's why things don't get dirty or wear out, and why everything looks so bright and new. Then I understood how heaven could be eternal. Next I noticed that I was loving everything and everybody and that it was making me intensely happy. Apparently only the good in me had survived. Without the bad, which is discord, I was happy beyond anything I had ever known. My next question was, how do you explain this intense happiness? Your thoughts are vibra uh, vibrations, which are controlled by the master vibration. It neutralizes all negative thoughts and lets you think only the good thoughts, such as love, freedom, and happiness. Then what becomes of the old grouches? If they are too bad, they go to a realm of lower vibrations where their kind of thoughts can live. If they come here, the master vibration would annihilate them. After death, people gravitate into hom homo homogenous groups according to the rate of their own, of their soul's vibrations. If the percent of discord in a person is small, it can be eliminated by the master vibration. Then the remaining good can live on here. For example, if a person were 70% good and 30% bad, the bad could be eliminated by the master vibration and the remaining good welcomed into heaven. However, if the percentage of bad were too high, this couldn't be done, and the person would have to gravitate to a lower level and live with people of his own kind. In the hereafter, each person, pers <laughs> person, each person lives in the kind of heaven or hell that he prepared for himself while on earth. If he threw a small pebble into a threshing machine, it would go into the box, not because it is good or bad, but because of its proper size and weight. It's the same way here. No one sends you anywhere. You are sorted by the high or low vibrations of your soul. Everyone goes where he fits in. High vibrations indicate love and spiritual development, while low vibrations indicate debasement and evil. When I asked what a person should do while on earth to make it better for him when he dies, he answered, All you can do is to develop along the lines of unselfish love. People don't come here because of their good deeds, or because they believe in this or that, but because they fit in and belong. Good deeds are the natural resort, result of being good, and bad deeds are the natural result of being bad. Each carries its own reward and punishment. It's what you are that counts. While we talked, my mind, or whatever I had to think with, became crystal clear. Instantly and without effort, I could remember everything I had ever known. I seemed to understand the earth and all about it. The whole scheme of life was plain as day. Everything on earth has its purpose. It all fits into a pattern which will, in the end, work out for justice and good. People worry because of their incomplete viewpoints. They don't realize that trouble is nature's way of teaching lessons that won't be learned otherwise. If we'd only learn from other people's troubles, we could avoid most of our own. While we were still talking, and I was enjoying the ecstasy of heaven, my friend gently announced, You can't stay here any longer. You have to go back to earth. Back to earth? Oh no! Not back to that horrible place. But already I was leaving this beautiful land and slipping back into my body, still enough in heaven to have no inhibitions, and yet far enough back into my body to have terrible thoughts. Like a kid having a tantrum, I kicked and screamed, Let me stay, let me stay. But all my protesting did no good. As I moved farther back into my body, there was a painful, prickly feeling all over, similar to a foot waking up. 
also a crowded feeling as if the real me was having to compress itself to get back into its hateful prison. The last thing the strange, the strong man said to me was, You have more important work to do on earth, and you must go back and do it. There will come a time of great confusion and the people will need your stabilizing influence. When your work on earth is done, you can come back here to stay. And that is the end of Arthur Jensen's near-death experience. Wow, that sounds like a great place to be, doesn't it, Knowledge Noggins? Sounds so fulfilling and blissful. I would love to be there myself. The next near-death experience is by a woman by the name of Pam Reynolds, and her story is as follows. Dr. Michael Sabom is a cardiologist whose book entitled Light and Death includes a detailed medical and scientific analysis of an amazing near-death experience of a woman named Pam Reynolds. In 1991, at the age of 35, Reynolds underwent a rare operation to remove a giant basilar artery aneurysm in her brain that threatened her life. The size and location of the aneurysm, however, precluded its safe removal using the standard (laughs) neurosurgical techniques. She was referred to a neurosurgeon, Dr. Robert F. Spitzler, of the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, who had pioneered a daring surgical procedure known as deep hypothermic cardiac arrest. It allowed Pam's aneurysm to be excised, excised with a reasonable chance of success. The operation, nicknamed Standstill, By the doctors who perform it required that Pam's body temperature be lowered to 60 degrees, her heartbeat and breathing stopped, her brain waves flattened, and the blood drained from her head. In everyday terms, she was put to death. After removing the aneurysm, she was restored to life. During the time that Pam was in a standstill, she experienced an NDE. Her remarkably detailed, veridical, uh verified out-of-body observations during her surgery were later verified to be true. Her case is considered to be one of the strongest cases of veridical evidence in NDE research because of her ability to describe the unique surgical instruments, the surgical procedures used on her, and her ability to describe in details these events while she was clinically brain dead. Pam Reynolds ultimately died from heart failure on Saturday, May 22, 2010 at the age of 53. When all of Pam's vital signs were stopped, the doctor turned on a surgical saw and began to cut through Pam's skull. While this was going on, Pam reported that she felt herself pop outside her body and hover above the operating table. She then watched the doctors working on her lifeless body for a while. From her out-of-body position, she observed the doctor sawing into her skull with what looked like, to her, an electric toothbrush. Pam heard and reported later that uh, what the nurses in the operating room had said and exactly what was happening during the operation. At this time, every monitor attached to Pam's body registered no life whatsoever. At some point, Pam's consciousness floated out of the operating room and traveled down a tunnel which had a light at the end of it where her deceased relatives and friends were waiting, including her long-dead grandmother. Pam's NDE ended when her deceased uncle led her back to her body for her to re-enter. Pam compared the feeling of re-entering her dead body as to plunging into a pool of ice. The following is Pam Reynolds' account of her NDE in her own words. The next thing I recall was the sound. It was a natural D. As I listened to the sound, I felt it was pulling me out of the top of my head. The further out of my body I got, the more clear the tone became. I had the impression it was like a road, a frequency that you can go on. I remember seeing several things in the operating room when I was looking down. It was the most aware that I think I have ever been in my entire life. I was metaphorically sitting on the doctor's shoulder. It was not like a normal vision. It was brighter and more focused and clearer than a normal vision. There was so much in the operating room that I didn't recognize, and so many people. I thought the way they had my head shaved was peculiar. I expected them to take all of the hair, but they did not. The saw thing, I hated the sound of. It looked like an electric toothbrush, and it had a dent in it. A groove at the top where the saw appeared to go into the handle, but it didn't. 
and the saw had interchangeable blades, too, but these blades were in what looked like a socket wrench case. I heard the saw crank up. I didn't see them use it on my head, but I think I heard it being used on something. It was a humming at a relatively high pitch, and then all of a sudden it went like that. Someone said something about my veins and my arteries being very small. I believe it was a female voice and that it was uh, Dr. Murray, but I'm not sure. She was the cardiologist. I remember thinking that I should have told her about that. I remember the heart-lung machine. I didn't like the respirator. I remember a lot of tools and instruments that I did not really recognize. There was a sensation like being pulled, but not against your will. I was on my own accord because I wanted to go. I have different metaphors to try to explain this. It was like the Wizard of Oz, being taken up a tornado vortex. Only you're not spinning around like you've got vertigo. You're very focused and you have a place to go. The feeling was like going up an elevator really fast. And there was a sensation, but it wasn't a bodily, physical sensation. It was like a tunnel, but it wasn't a tunnel. At some point very early in the tunnel vortex, I became aware of my grandmother calling me. But I didn't hear her call me with my ears. It was a clearer hearing than with my ears. A true sense, more than I trust my own ears. It was a sense. The feeling was that she wanted me to come to her, so I continued with no fear down the shaft. It's a dark shaft that I went through, and at the very end there was this very little tiny pinpoint of light that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The light was incredibly bright, like sitting in the middle of a light bulb. It was so bright that I put my hands in front of my face fully expecting to see them and I could not. But I knew they were there. Not from a sense of touch. Again, it's terribly hard to explain, but I knew they were there. I noticed that as I began to discern the different figures in the light, and they were all covered with the light, they were light and had light permeating all around them. They began to form shapes I could recognize and understand. I could see that one of them was my grandmother. I don't know if it was reality or a projection, but I would know my grandmother, the sound of her, anytime, anywhere. Everyone I saw looking back on it, it fit perfectly into my understanding of what that person looked like at their best during their lives. I recognized a lot of people. My Uncle Gene was there, so was my great Aunt Maggie, who was really my cousin. On Papa's side of the family, my grandfather was there. They were specifically taking care of me, looking after me. They would not permit me to go further. It was communicated to me that's the best uh, way I know how to say it, or the best way I know how to say it, because they didn't speak like I'm speaking. That if I went all the way into the light, something would happen to me physically. They would be unable to put this me. Uh, they would be unable to put me back in the body, like I had gone too far, and they couldn't connect, couldn't reconnect so they wouldn't let me go anywhere or do anything. I wanted to go into the light, but I also wanted to come back. I had children to be reared. It was like watching a movie on Fast Forward on your VCR. You could get the general idea, but the individual freeze frames are not slow enough to get the details. Then they, the deceased relatives, were feeding me. They were not doing this through my mouth, like with food, but they were nourishing me with something. The only way I know how to put it is if something... Something sparkly. Sparkles is the image that I get. I definitely recall the sensation of being nurtured and being fed on a, and being made strong. I know it sounds funny, because obviously it wasn't a physical thing, but inside the experience I felt physically strong, ready for whatever. My grandmother didn't take me back through the tunnel, or even send me back to or ask me to go. She just looked up at me. I expected to go with her but it was communicated to me that she just didn't think she would do that. My uncle said he would too, or he thought he would do it. He's the one who took me back through the end of the tunnel. Everything was fine. I did want to go. But then I got to the end of it and saw the thing, my body. I didn't want to get into it. It looked terrible, like a train wreck. It looked like what a, it looked like a, it was dead. I believe it was covered. It scared me and I didn't want to look at it. It was communicated to me that it was like jumping into a swimming pool. No problem. Just jump right into the swimming pool. I didn't want to, 
but I guess I was late or something because he, the uncle, pushed me. I felt a definitive re uh, repelling and at the same time a pulling from the body. The body was pulling and the tunnel was pushing. It was like diving into a pool of ice water. It hurt. When I came back, they were playing Hotel California and the line was, You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Or however that song goes. <laughs> I mentioned later to Dr. Brown that that was incredibly insensitive and he told me that I needed to sleep more. <laughs> when I uh, regained consciousness, I was still on the respirator. Well, that's pretty inter interesting stuff right there, isn't it, Knowledge Noggins? <laughs> pretty cool stuff. NDEs. They sound great. I, I would like to have one, kind of, but I don't want to get in a car wreck to, to experience such thing. All right. Let's move on to the next NDE of Brian Kreb. Some people have reported having an NDE while experiencing an alien abduction. Other experiencers have seen alien-type beings during their NDE. There appears to be a connection between these aliens and the beings of light reported in so many NDEs. Brian Kreb's NDE describes just such an encounter. Brian's NDE appears in Kevin Williams' NDE book entitled Nothing Better Than Death, and the following is in Brian Kreb's own words. I had my first near-death experience when I was a child, perhaps two or three. This would be about 1953. It involves me drowning. My memories of it were of seeing my body below me. I remember seeing a bright, warm, loving orb above me. I panicked, Dad and Mom below. I didn't know it was anything to talk about, and no one would have believed me. It never was a thing I felt I had to relate. Then, in 1971, I had been knifed with a stiletto that severed an artery above my liver. I remember looking up and seeing a light. I then looked down at my body and then I was confronted by at least two beings. They were human in appearance and they seemed to float in midair. I realized I was far above my body and not in an earthly space. The beings tried to keep me from going to the light. I don't know why. They just seemed terrified and didn't want me to go. But I did. I shot up like an arrow through what I can only describe as a tunnel. I saw the tunnel as a peripheral blur of stars and I saw a loving light before me. Then I stopped. I was there with this orb of glowing love and understanding. It didn't seem to, to uh, didn't seem foreign to me. It was not frightening. It was totally assuring and there was no feeling of anything but my awe and the love and knowledge of, and wisdom this orb projected. In size, it would be not like looking at the sun, but looking at the earth when you are on it. It was immense and total, and its power was love. I felt a presence next to me, a man, and he asked if I was ready for my life review. I said yes. All of this not a verbal thing, but just a knowledge. Then I saw something like an HO scale train set below, a city. I went to this city and I went through my life. I went through every moment and every feeling. I was not afraid as I was still in the light. I talked with the man about my life, but I do not remember any specifics. I then remember standing, as it were there, in the light of the orb of love. I felt the goodness of and love and knowledge of it. My mind was in a state of deep, deep concentration of thought. I then went to twelve beings of greater knowledge. They were in front of me and stood in a row. They were not human. They had no feelings of any anything like judgment or authority but seemed strong in themselves. They seemed taller than I did, and they uh, wore silver-white robes. They had white skin, large heads, and large eyes. I do not remember having them having a mouth. Above them was a spirit. It was like a star as we see one from Earth, but in size it appeared the same size as the heads of the beings. The spirit went to my left and hovered above the first being. I remember it was like a video of knowledge springing from the being's hands, which were held in front of them. Kind of sounds like he's talking about Nordics. Each being has had something to relate. They opened the knowledge and they had when uh, the spirit moved above them. The last told me what I could do if I came back and the significance of it. I only remember seeing young man with his head back in pain as if his neck was injured. I said, oh, Aaron, my son. They said, no, not that son. 
and I realized whom they meant. In, eight, in 1978, my other child was born a son. Then I made the decision to come back to Earth, and I remember it was such a hard decision. It was so difficult because everything there was so beautiful, and there was so, so, so much love. I had the feeling of free will, yet a feeling of duty was present, of obligation. And the second I realized that, I shot back into my body. After two near-death experiences and having studied many NDEs, I am convinced there is order to the experience. I do get angry when people come to conclusions about near-death experiences because they think it is in order in they think it is not orderly and therefore find it to be part of our imaginative minds. For the ones that have not heard this, here goes. Rule number 1. At any given mis in at every given microsecond, you may return to your body. You have a trauma of some kind making you some kind making you leave your body. You might feel a vibration you might feel nothing except that you are suddenly out of your body. Rule number two. Nobody remembers every single detail and the meaning to it while having an NDE. So, now you are out of your body, you may look down and see your body. You may take off for another room or zip back into your body. You may go into the void. This is the home of many a grim story. See, after death, you may end up quite stuck in this void. It lacks one thing. Love. It is the hell the Pope just figured out. It is not being of love, not recognizing it. Those who are stuck may uh, frighten you by just being or by intentionally gestures, gestures to you to frighten you. They are stuck and they are confused and they will put hell in hell. Scary beings in the void. Rule number three. Beyond this point, your soul must be convinced your body is dead. See, sometimes things happen which doesn't cause death. I mean, we all ultimately live to tell of NDEs, but we must be convinced the body business is behind us to go further. So, there you are outside the body. Now those who love you might show up. They do so for a couple of reasons. One, they may want you to stay, that is, go back to your body, or they may want you to think of love. I just love the way George Rodania wrote, Rodania <laughs> said it. While describing the void, he said that he thought, I am, and if I am, why for not I can be happy? And he was. Then he thought, if I am, and I can be happy, why for not then can I feel love? And he did. You see, the way out of this void is simple. You must think of love. Love, love, love. Now, if you are a Christian and you do think of Jesus and you see Jesus' love, then you will be thinking of love and to think of love, to recognize it as a reality. That is the key to getting out of the void. Now, you are in the void and you, you can uh, think of love and you are love and you will see love just a speck, but you will concentrate on it and then you will connect with it. This connection is called the tunnel. It is a pathway to the Creator. I recently heard someone talking about taking some sugar and some water and mixing them together. The sugar would disappear and the water would become sugar water. But in time the water would evaporate and the sugar would remain as sugar and the water would turn to vapor. The point was that the sugar had the memory of the water and the water the memory of the sugar. As I thought this out, I tried to think how to explain it better. Being of scientific background, I thought, okay... Let's put the sugar and the water together in a test tube. Let's mix them. Then to speed things up, let's add heat, which makes vibrations and causes the water to turn to vapor. But wait. Let's put a rubber stopper in the test tube and a glass tube leading to another test tube. That would allow the water to reestablish itself as water in the other tube. You see? Then you have water with a memory of the sugar and the sugar with a memory of the water. You also have a very good model to explain how to get out of the void. As the tube concentrates, the water... So the tunnel concentrates the spirit. Now many things can happen in the tunnel. Say for instance you get depressed and gobble down too many pills. You would choke if not for washing it down with all the booze you gave them. You might end up in the tunnel off to the side where you are requested to, th uh, to think. So you sit there thinking. Some other soul would pass right on by that. Not notice or many or or may may notice. Things earthly problems can be worked out there. 
out of the void and in the tunnel. Ultimately though, if you don't return to your body, you zip right past all this and end up at the point that you may refer later to the end of the tunnel. It may be, though, that you are in one of the rooms of the tunnel or zones. There you see a garden, a river, a gate, and someone will appear to help you decide whether you should go on or think a while or talk or be reassured enough to return to your body. But go through the gate or over the river, pass the decision to go back to you to stay or to think, and you end up at the end of the tunnel. There at the end of the tunnel is the creator. Rule number four. If you make it to the end of the tunnel, you will feel more love and acceptance and wisdom and knowledge and understanding than you ever have. And you will remember it. And you will not leave it out of your description of your experience. There you are and there is love. Overwhelming, pure, beautiful love. Now let's not forget rule one that you may at any time zip right back into your body. You should begin now to see why there are so many different descriptions of the NDE, because a person may go only to a given point, and the description of what they saw will be limited to that travel, and to that level. So, now you are there in front of the Creator, and you might well see your higher self. You will then go through a life review. You do this in the light of the love of the Creator, in this love, you see all you have done wrong and right and the effects of it, and you are unafraid because the Creator's love is there, loves you. There's nothing but the truth. With that accomplished, you may zip back into your body. You may then do whatever you think you need to do, and those descriptions vary. One consistent theme is that you have spirits to help you. I, as Danny and Brinkley did, had 12 spirits giving forth information about the past, the present, and the future. They may help you decide to stay or go back to Earth. Once the decision is made, zip, you're back. And that is his NDE experience. That was Brian Kreb. Brian Kreb's ex explanation of the great tunnel and the light at the end, full of pure love and embracement. So if any of you guys have an NDE, and you're aware of it, you're aware that you're out of your body, go to the light, because that's where the love is. You don't want to get stuck in the void and in limbo with these scary creatures and confusion and whatnot. So go to the light, just like they always say, follow the light to the end of the tunnel. So, and a lot of people claim they see Jesus Christ, and, uh, I believe he exists. I believe he's there. I've had some great moments in my life what's made me cry and tear up. They weren't NDEs, but I, you know, when I was younger, I had a, a church experience that made me cry, and I've always believed in Jesus. Doesn't matter what religion you're in, you can believe in Jesus Christ. And I love you, and he loves you too. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. Remember to love people and to treat them good. Because love is the truth, the one truth. I love you. Thanks for tuning in. Much love and peace out.